uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the keynote theatre. Uh, my name is Adeline Siu. I'm the editor of Pharmaceutical Technology Europe. And I hope this will be a fruitful discussion on the strategic alliances within the pharmaceutical industry and what the future holds for the healthcare business model. So uh, we're running a bit late and I would like to kick start this discussion straight away because uh, one of our panel members he has to run off for a press conference. So let me introduce our panel. Um, we have uh, Dr. Alan Shepherd, who is the Principal of Global Generics, taught leadership from IMS Health UK. We also have our Professor Trevor Jones, who is the Director of Elegant um, USA. He's also the Chairman of the CRO Simbeck Orion Limited, and he has many hats. And of course, we have uh, Mr. Pandey, who is Joint Secretary uh, from the Department of Commerce, Government of India. So I'll start my question um, for Mr. Pandey first, because he has to run off. Uh, Mr. Pandey, uh, we know that India is like recognized as the rising star and especially in this era where governments are trying to drive down the cost of medicine. So uh, where do you see this, um, uh, the, this opportunity for generics and what, how does the Indian pharmaceutical industry fit in into the whole picture? Uh, I think uh, you have made a very important point uh, which uh, needs a little broader perspective uh, before I answer. See, for the pharmaceutical industry, uh, India very strongly feels that uh, it should be seen something more than industry. Means this is one industry where ethics are extremely important because you are dealing with very sensitive issues. You are dealing with the life and health of the citizens. It is not merely an industry. Means this is one fundamental point that one would like to make. So. While profit is important for any industry to survive, it's equally important that it remains in the reasonable limits. This is one of the fundamental points. India has a huge challenge to itself. It has to cater to the health requirement of 1.26 billion people and people who do not have a very good purchasing power uh, uh, 33 percent people still live below poverty line. So it's our own challenge that we make medicines which are affordable. And when I'm saying affordable, I'm saying no compromise on the quality. A very recent example uh, why I'm trying to draw a parallel. See, we made it possible for our satellite mom to land Mars at one-tenth the price in the first attempt. So uh, the less in cost doesn't always mean poor quality. Now cost uh, is a factor of a number of variables and India has a natural advantage of those variables and it can produce same thing of the same quality at lower cost. And in next about five years, five to six years, a lot of patents are going to go off patent, uh, which means a huge opportunity for the global generic industry. And uh, therefore, there is not only role for India, but role for all generic players in the world. Uh, among the top uh, Global generic companies, five Indian companies also uh, are listed. And therefore, I am not saying it is opportunity only for India. It is opportunity for all global industry, entire global industry, to make available those medicines to those people who otherwise cannot afford them. So we see a collective responsibility of the industry, of respective governments, and of course, research institutions. It's interesting that you brought up the issue of quality, yeah? and um, uh, we know that the cheapest is not necessarily the best, but then again, uh, the most expensive doesn't necessarily give you the highest quality as well. So how can you convince that um, medicines manufactured in India has this quality that uh, we are looking for? See, uh, uh, throughout the day, there has been a lot of discussion, there have been a lot of talks, and uh, uh, we each country is trying to bring in its own regulatory regime. 
See, every day new aspect of science is discovered, means what we knew yesterday uh, is not going to hold uh, good for tomorrow. As a result of which what is happening that every day raising bar is good. Uh, India doesn't say that you don't raise bar to protect, to guarantee quality. But at times uh, we raise bar so much that without any incremental benefit for the quality, we raise the cost. Now, we only question that aspect that if by raising bar you do not get any incremental benefit for the quality, then ultimately it is the consumer who is going to pay. It is, it is even if government pays, ultimately it is the citizens of that country that pay tax and ultimately the uh, consumers pay. Therefore, a very judicious balance is to be maintained when deciding on the pricing and setting standards. International efforts are on to, to harmonize as much as possible. Perfect harmonization is not possible that also we all know each country has different laws, different regulations, a different scientific research, but still perhaps there is a need for a closer cooperation to ensure that wherever possible we have harmonized approach so that we do not create new barriers. This is one industry if you see globally when we are talking of lowering the tariffs, we are talking of lowering the NTBs, the non-tariff barriers. Uh, this is one industry where we see new barriers coming up in different markets, which is quite contrary to the international uh, demands that we make otherwise. Sure. I, 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 uh, I absolutely support the idea that there is uh, a limit to how far one should take the quality agenda before it is a self-defeating uh, purpose. And I certainly agree that once a patent expires, as long as there's quality there, then price becomes very important. But I think we must reflect on this. By the very nature, generics are at least 20 years old. Science has moved on hugely in that time. And if we don't promote innovative new products, our patients will not get the benefit. Classical example is antibiotics with resistance growing. And the old antibiotics have still got some value. But unless we invest in new chemical, new biological entities and pay for them, and who's going to pay for that innovation, then we're not going to solve the problems for our patients. Perfectly valid point. I think everybody would agree with this. Yeah, uh, thanks, Trevor. Yeah, so I would like to ask the question, yeah, so who should be the one paying for innovation? Because obviously we see that biotech is the one having a lot of, like, innovation coming well, up, whereas pharma... You just heard, the, U the U.S. citizens pay for innovation. <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, I do understand that with the economic pressures on our own personal budgets, but on the governments in Europe and elsewhere, and health being a very significant part of that, and with an aging population and a demanding population and rightly an involved patient population saying, excuse me, I've paid, it's my health, then I think there is a pressure on, on uh, who's going to pay. But, you know, where is society going to lay that balance between defense, education, Medicare. and health? As you Medicare. rightly said in your opening comment, it's a fundamental of health being that. And so what we have to do is all of us in this room and elsewhere is work with patients, Absolutely. with professionals to convince the politicians that this has to be more of a priority. In my country, the health bill is a very small percentage of the GDP compared with, say, America. Same here. And in the India. same in India. And we have to get that balance. Now, politicians don't normally rebalance the budget. They pair away at each other's <laughs> budgets. But they have, we have to have this rethink. Yeah, so we know that uh, payers, they always emphasize on value. Yeah, it's always about value. And we've seen like the case with uh, Roche cancer drugs where in the UK, the NHS is not willing to pay for it. So uh, what do you think about it, Alan? It's like, how can we make healthcare more sustainable, more affordable, so that the medicines that the pharma companies have actually invested a lot of money and research and development into actually reaches the patients? So. 
I think yeah. a lot of it is, 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 as Trevor has said really, is it, it's also down to, to clinical need. Um, patients are going to be demanding these new advances. And what we're seeing is that, in, for example, you take the USA, quite often as a patient, you don't have a choice. Your insurance company decides what you're going Absolutely. to receive. Um, <clears throat> we have it in the UK with the uh, rationing, and, and we now have the cancer fund, yep. which, as soon as it's announced, is almost gone. So it, it's a case of money's being made available, but who actually decides who gets what medicine is, is not really in the hands of the individual, is not in the hands of the patient, unless, of course, you are a very wealthy individual. And then paying for it is it's going to come out of your own pocket. And I think that even in India, where now there's, there is an, an increasing wealth in the population, but a lot of it is still the yeah. patient has to pay out of their own pocket. That's right. And, of course, they cannot afford innovation. Yeah. And hence, you have the, the, the agreement from Gilead that they will price the Valdi at 1% of the price in Western, in Western markets. Now that's a reflection of who is gonna pay. It's, if you, I often say, I work for Access to Medicines in Africa, and people have heard me say this before. If you haven't got any money, it doesn't matter how expensive exactly. the product is. It's access to the medicine and meeting patients' needs. And who pays for it is a government decision. Um, but we go back to the, 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 the starting point. Governments don't have enough money. Yeah. But and Trevor has been a big store of this is when he was running the ABPI as DJ is, is it, it's, it's all about um, new medicines and the, the ability of patients to access health care. And it, it, it really is not governments who should be in charge of that, but they focus on pharmaceutical costs. They don't focus on the, the bigger picture. Well, you all know that the political agenda is usually the next election. Hmm. Yeah. And... Investing in health is a long-term thing. You all know that, that prevention actually can reduce really costs good. in the long term. Really uh, but for a politician, their budget ends at that uh, election and therefore it's short-termism. So, I mean, we really have to get them to re-understand the way that money is spent in their economies. I think on this point, uh, both uh, Professor Trevor and Alan made a uh, very important point. Uh, <coughs> and I saw uh, some good beginning in India. I, I would like to share that. A French company, Sanofi, very recently about in last week, they uh, had a collaboration with one of the leading healthcare organization in India, namely Apollo. And Apollo and Sanofi have joined hands and they have come for the first time for integrated therapy on diabetes. And what they are trying to do, and Sanofi CEO himself was there, and he said, for us, being in the pharmaceutical business, this is for the first time. We have made patient the central figure in the entire scheme of things. Otherwise, it's either the pharmaceutical company, or the doctor, or the insurance company, who are deciding about the patient. And it is the person, patient, who, who is getting shuttled from endocrinologist to uh, medicine expert to third doctor, fourth doctors. So they said, we are going to start, they have named this uh, uh, Apollo Sugar Program because in India, diabetes is second highest after China. The largest number, China has almost, uh, almost uh, 98 a million uh, uh, patients uh, suffering from diabetes. India has about 68 million. Yeah, because of the uh, uh, eating habit. But then the point that uh, Trevor made, it's very important that we have a long-term perspective. And this integrated therapy concept, they said, uh, could be beginning for dealing with some of the chronic diseases and bring down the cost of treatment for the patient if we have a long-term perspective on them. And that's where the strategic alliance comes in. It's not just the concept of a partnership between professional patient, prescriber, and politician. But if you look at the massive advances in medical technology that are taking place, 
I've seen in India recently where you can do diabetic monitoring, yeah. feeding directly into a yeah. little iPhone, feeding into an advice to the patient, feeding into saying, take some more of your medicines. Yeah. Now that, in yeah. the end, that closed loop really, really works for the patient. Yeah. It certainly works for, for reducing spend yes. when you get to a crisis. Yeah. But that's an alliance we have to form in our industry between med tech companies, yeah. electronic providers, and pharmaceuticals. Yeah. This is a new world we're living in. Mm -hmm. Point, Trevor. So uh, we are seeing increasing consolidation within the pharmaceutical industry. And perhaps, Alan, you'd like to share with us the role of mergers and acquisitions, the different categories of acquisitions, and how um, the targets have changed, like the profiles of those companies acquiring, what are they looking for now? I think, um, as we said earlier in one of the modules, that obviously we're still seeing consolidation within the industry. And what, what, uh, what you can really break those down into is the, the three different types of, of uh, mergers and, and acquisitions. You, you firstly got the, um, the financial one. Uh, these tend to be mainly hostile, um, quite often of a mega proportion, uh, and of late uh, geared to tax inversions. Um, as uh, my colleague on my right will know, as uh, a, di a director of, uh, of Allegan and... Uh, the, the pursuit of uh, Allegan by Valiant is probably an example of that. And of course, then we've had the other one, which was the Pfizer uh, pursuit uh, of AstraZeneca. Um, there's still an element in some of those of big is better. And uh, I think you only have to go back five years where big is better was the, was the real uh, buzzword and everybody was looking to get bigger. But suddenly, uh, the sustainability of that uh, mammoth of a company has become more of a problem. Um, the problem with the financial type of uh, acquisition is that quite often it can be driven by investors, which doesn't really leave the management much option. Absolutely. So um, I think it's interesting to see those. But then the other one is, of course, the, the diversification type uh, acquisition or merger. Um, that can be often geographical, but is more often a portfolio representing a gap in the portfolio or a non-coverage of a, a geographical territory. Um, Examples of that is obviously the acquisition of Forest Laboratories by Actavis, where a generic company wanted to focus onto brands. And in the, in the 10 years or so that I've been more involved in the generic industry, I haven't met a generic company who doesn't want to be a specialist uh, originator R&D company. Everybody has that, that vision. Uh, unfortunately, the route to that is uh, a little bit more difficult, but... Uh, I was always told a vision is something you put up there and you'll never achieve it, but it looks good for the investors and the employees. But uh, I think th times have changed since then. And we've recently had uh, the Malincroft uh, and, and Questa uh, acquisition, uh, adding a wide range of specialities across many, many therapeutic areas. So quite a bit of diversification. And of course then Sun Pharma yep. um, stepping in on Rambaxi. Um, huge portfolio expansion and, and solid geographical presence in, in markets that would otherwise not been available to them. So that's a diversification. Then finally, of course, the, the strategic acquisitions. Um, where you're going to try and go for strategic advantage and dominance maybe of a particular therapeutic area, either through acquiring technology, um, access to platforms for products in late stage development, uh, allowing you to get to the market quicker with, uh, with, uh, with products that the, the, the markets really need. Um, we've seen that the two, the two real deals there has been the GSK Novartis deal, providing Novartis with a, a leading p a position in terms of oncology, and giving at the same time GSK a, a significant advantage now in the, the vaccines business. Uh, on from that, um, of course, that same sort of arrangement uh, put the combined companies together at the top of the Consumer Healthcare League. So reshaping the consumer healthcare market completely. Okay, Merck and Bayer are close behind with their, their merger, but um, changing the whole landscape with regard to, um, to an acquisition. And so the, the other one which is just announced, which I was more interested with, J&J &J with the acquisition of Alios Bar Biopharma, which gives it an extended reach into antivirals and particularly, as it's a hot topic at the moment, the, the um, attractive hepatitis C treatment market. So. That's sort of the three big ones. But then we've got lots of smaller portfolio de deals, putting companies into positions that they wouldn't be in with their own organic uh, growth and organic development. So you, you can now look at names like Al, Al Morale in Dermatology, Par with Branded Generics and, and, and Generic Sterile Injections, 
um, Faring, Bayer activists, and uh, Gideon Richter, all of them are very active and dominant in women's health. So acquisitions to actually uh, a, a, a achieve a position of dominance, they're going to be going on all the time. Because I think, the, as we said, R&D is getting more expensive, it's riskier. Um, anything to actually reduce those costs, reduce those risks, then acquisitions and mergers uh, offer a, a quicker way to market and perhaps more financially acceptable. I think, one. you know, when you get to a stagnation of growth with the pressures on prices, it behoves a board of directors to think about the shareholders and say, how can I add that value? And as you say, mm -hmm. Those which actually accelerate your portfolio with therapeutic specialization are pretty attractive. As, and, and it gives you the opportunity at, actually to actually diversify or discontinue. Yeah. Because very often companies just carry on along the lines they've been going. And although they have strategic views, they, they don't like giving things up. And this, these mergers give you that chance. I think there's still very good money to be uh, gained in strategic terms by synergies in uh, SG&A and R&D in the portfolio. But my concern with the big mergers has been it really hasn't been more productive no. in terms of R&D. Innovation, yes. And there's a great danger that you go through a period of a year or more where nothing happens, uh, the portfolios are too big, and then you know the clock's running in terms of the patent, and there's indecision, and then discovery starts to weaken. So to me, it's got to be like good surgery. It's got to be very accurate and very well done and rapid. And you've got to then set the, p the pathway and deliver. Then the patient gets through that and, and survives. Because you see so many examples where mergers have taken place, or just alliances, where they just get into a loose situation. And in that mm. situation, you, you start to see the, 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 th the things mm. falling apart. Yeah, I suppose just outside of that, also in terms of diversification, was the um, the Lilly acquisition of the Novartis animal health business. Yeah. You talk about Novartis no longer wanted to be in that sector, decided that from even from an investor's perspective, let's get out, yeah. let's, let's capitalize that investment that we've made previously and uh, use that money to do something else. And you say like the vaccine <laughs> sectors come together. In yeah. fact, the Novartis vaccines were my vaccines in Welcome, went to Evans, went to Novartis. They were my vaccines and they were your in vaccines Evans. In Evans. <laughs> yeah, thank all, you. But that's true, you know, in that field, there uh, used to be 20 companies, it went down to five, oh, and now, yeah. You know, consolidation through strategic alliance or merger and not just acceleration of your yeah. portfolio is pretty important. Yeah. Uh, one, one good development that is taking place on the acquisitions and merger uh, is in the demographic uh, background uh, mm. of how the world is uh, evolving. Uh, you see, uh, in a lot of emerging markets, the disposable income is gradually increasing and uh, demand for lifestyle changes are happening. Uh, demand for medicines is also growing. The pharmaceutical market is uh, growing faster there. Uh, but still, the affordability remains a very issue. sensitive uh, yep. issue. And therefore, a lot of companies are making investment, acquiring smaller companies in those territories, because producing there is, is uh, uh, cost effective for them. And they can serve that larger volumes by being there and uh, can have same amount of profit as perhaps by serving a small market uh, they would have earned. So I'm a small, can I ask yeah. one question firstly? Yeah. Your, your, your position there then. So how now is the Indian government viewing acquisitions of companies like uh, Piramal with, by Abbott and also then Rambaxi by the Japanese um, how, how are you, because you did take some action with regard to trying to make it more difficult for that type of large acquisition of an Indian pharmaceutical really right. company. Uh, I think you have made a very valid point and it's important for me to share perspective. See, in India, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical sector is being dealt uh, for a variety of reasons a little differently. The reason is that our health uh, insurance coverage for the population is not there. Uh, most of the healthcare expenditure is out-of-pocket expense mm. and by the patient. And therefore, uh, it's extremely important that he has access to those medicines. So only factor which is governing government policies at the moment in absence of good health insurance coverage is that at least the essential medicines and the government has identified, they have listed in, in their uh, 
which is an essential medicine, which is required to be made available to people at affordable price. And therefore, barring the essential medicines, where the price fixation is done by the government, the National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority does the fixation of the medicines, uh, which is listed in the schedule. Uh, all other medicines are not controlled. Prices that's, that's are price not. price controlled, yeah. Right? Now, therefore, when acquisitions and mergers are taking place, the Competition Commission, which is the, ent the antitrust co uh, commission in other countries, they only try to see this point, whether by this acquisition, uh, is the company trying to gain monopoly in the market mm -hmm. and control the price or not? Even, even after the Renbexi has been taken over by an Indian company, Sun Pharma, the Competition Commission has uh, issued notices and they are going into this dimension that which products, which medicines uh, okay. are going to be uh, a kind of dominated by this new company and the prices may be monopoly prices in the market. I think it really is. It's absolutely right. It's about the access to the market. I mean, India is fortunate in that it can offer a contract facility for yeah. manufacture, but it's not, if you're a foreign company, that's okay for manufacture, but it's not the same as access to the market yeah. and having some ownership of a, a local company. So in the brick economies, there aren't that many companies in many parts of South America that have that infrastructure and understanding yes. of research, development, manufacturing, yeah. supply. So it makes India a somewhat easier way of entering through a foreign uh, yeah. trade. Yeah. 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 Right, uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Pandey has to leave us now because um, he's catching another press conference at, on, at 7. So, But we still have Alan and Trevor. So uh, thank you, Mr. Pandey. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. 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 So, uh, uh, we still have uh, Trevor and Alan here, and um, if you have any questions for our panel, feel free to throw some questions at them. I th exactly. Uh, it depends on what part of the industry you're in, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I can't think of any other time in my history, and I'm getting old, when the science has been so exciting, when the opportunities for innovation are so huge. You know that, that that we after the sequencing of the human genome and the epigenome, we've started uncovering pathways that are really incredible, and our ability to stratify and personalize medicine is just a golden opportunity. But hey, you've got to get in and do it, and not just sit back and hope. You know, it's actually, it, you know, not everybody's going to be successful in this business. So to my mind, you know, it's getting to those areas of really frontier science and making your mark in there, and that is a good time to be here. Some Absolutely. really great companies around right now. The behemoths that we've seen grow uh, and rely on traditional approaches, I think, are in for a trouble. It's almost like a double act, because Trevor was Glaxo, Glaxo Welcome, and I was Smith Klein, so yeah. got, and now they're together. Same. So we used to fight, you know, R&D programs, exactly the same, mirror yeah. images, yeah. fighting for the market. Those days are going to disappear because you can't afford to do that anymore. What I keep seeing is that on the one side, there's still a lot of opportunity to continue innovating in drugs. Innovation is very expensive. And then more and more governments keep pushing into price and price referencing. And on the other, on the other side, it's like, yes, it is less than 10% of the expense. But everybody focuses on the 10%, everybody focuses on the 90%. And at some point, it's like, OK, where is an industry? Where do we keep going? Because there's not much places to win, especially when we want to keep the very high quality standards. I mean, you're absolutely right. You know how much it costs to develop a drug. I don't have to go through that math. And uh, even though you can take all the sunk costs and so on out, it's very, very expensive. And yet we still have payers, whether it's government or sick funds or others, who simply want to pay generic prices for innovation. And we cannot do that. There is no way that the industry can deliver these new advances without that. OK, so we get into niches rather than blockbusters, niche busters, you know? Smaller populations where, in fact, uh, you can achieve a, a major differentiation because that's what value is about. 
but that's going to cost. It's still going to be a multiple of the kind of prices that most governments have. So to me, you know, we have, we all have, to, it's our future. We have to be out there influencing that agenda politically with the patients and with the providers, because otherwise the governments aren't going to do it for you. Well, Alan, you raised a very, very interesting question. Do you feel more healthy in the health industry? Um, well, I think we come down really to an industry now. I think we have, like other industry, we have to cope. We have to cope with competition. And I think this could make us stronger and may also feel us more healthier. Um, I think the patent, we talk about the patent lift, so even for the originators, the patent protection has more or less gone. Mm -hmm. And they also come now down to competition. They have to compete with generics. They have to compete with efficiency. And they have to compete really if they are innovators. Do they really have new molecules? Where is the innovation we pay for? Even on the biologicals, are they real innovation? I don't know. So really we come to competition, and competition may be healthy. So yep. frankly speaking, I feel more That's healthy on this. Yeah. And I think you know, Trevor said he's getting old. Um, I think the, the um, I, I, I resemble that remark as well. But, um, <laughs> the, I think, I, I don't know about you, but the competition and the standards within our industry at the moment have meant that some of the young, bright people that I've met are far and above the bright young people yeah. who were my staff yeah. when I was running the companies. Yeah. They, they got leaner, they got hungrier, they yeah. got more, more focused, more motivated. So I think you're right, Hans, that this, this troubled time, I remember we have a saying in England that is don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. I can remember 15 years ago, I was saying to people, don't go into the pharmaceutical industry, it's doom and gloom, everything's going to fold in on itself and everything else. Whereas now, today, Trevor with his technology examples, yeah, it's never been a more exciting time to be in there. Well, thank you very much for a very exciting, stimulating panel discussion. Uh, actually, I was thinking that this industry has been doing a great job. When we think 100 years back, a human being lived 50, 60 maximum. Oh, Nowadays, a human well, being is living almost 100. Yeah. Uh, WHO says a woman 97, a man 87, 89. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that one aspect that we are not really taking too much into consideration is what will happen in the next years. In two, two years back, Japan has won the Nobel Prize for the stem cells, the induced pluripotent stem cells. That's definitely will revolutionize the way how we will be treating diseases in the future. There's a regenerative medicine. That means if you are diabetic, you can get with your own stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, regenerating your uh, pancreas, uh, and the human being will live 200 years old. This will be a reality. And then the grandsons will say, when he will die, the grandfather, we want to inherit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, a very important part. And this, again, is something which Trevor, with his years in the ABPI, worked very hard. The press that the pharmaceutical industry gets never recognizes the achievements of the pharmaceutical yeah, industry. But I, I want to pick your point because it's really absolutely central. You know, in 1904 in London, there was a crisis and they all got together, all the people who run the town. And I was too and young and then, Trevor. Yeah, and, <laughs> and they said, we have to do something about the traffic in London because the whole town's going to come to a stop because we should be under three foot of horse manure. <laughs> now, nobody thought about the electric car and changes. You know, what you're saying is you can get a scientific discontinuity like regenerative medicine or med tech links and so on. We're looking at, you know, way we can influence brain and so on which can completely change the way in which the direction of health goes and so on. The trouble is, yeah, if you're 200, it's not just if your son wants your inheritance, <laughs> if you've got a, a, a young mind in an old body, and I'm not sure I want that. I just want to explain why I didn't raise my hand. I'm from the States, I'm in the generic business, and FDA has proposed a, a rule of all generics can label their generics differently from the originator. And yeah, so I don't important. want my son to grow up to be a pharmacist. I want him to grow up to be a trial lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> it's re um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you had this debate today and elsewhere, but of course many generics are bioequivalent uh, by definition, and it doesn't matter, they're therapeutically equivalent. But you will all know examples where a fact that 
a drug in a few patients, a few volunteers, shows plus or minus 20% of Tmax and Cmax. In epilepsy, doesn't make it biotherapeutically equivalent. So I'm very much in favor of saying, look, if every, different, every month I'm going to get a different fill in my prescription, then f if it's aspirin, I don't mind too much. But not if I'm on the chronic therapy, because you're back to your biosimilars again. You know, these are not therapeutically equivalent. So I'm very much in favor of that, provided it's properly done. That's why I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you, Ritz. Uh, Got to go. One more question. Nope. Right, uh, due to the interest of time, we have to close now. Um, but uh, I would like to thank our panel for their invaluable insights. And you can continue the discussion because we have a drinks reception downstairs. So please stay behind. And if you want to speak more uh, with uh, Trevor and Alan, feel free. Uh, also, there's an evaluation form at the back of your agenda. We'd be grateful if you could fill it and, and send it in before you leave today. So, at the back of the book. So, so yeah, the evaluation form at the back. So uh, just let us know your thoughts about the program. So, so, um, right, thank you.